just starting all over from scratch is obviously a very scary thing to do. And you can either thrive in that or you could let it completely take you over. A lot of people don't realize that there's a lot of fine print around these types of options. Like when it comes to choosing your insurance option, obviously it's important to know what are my needs? What is my budget? Like once you are going through a divorce, because it's a change in the family size and status that allows you to access everything that's out there. Um, usually when I'm trying to understand someone's situation, obviously I just want to know what are you doing currently? What are you paying currently? What is the budget that we have? Hi, my name is Lena Wynn. I'm a divorce lawyer and your host. Next with Lena Wynn is all about helping you grow mentally, physically, and financially through and after a divorce. I share conversations with professionals to help you as you embark on your next journey in life. The following information provided is for general informational purposes only. It does not and is not intended to constitute or substitute legal, medical, or professional advice. My next guest is a former operating officer of a fitness company and now a health insurance advisor managing a team of over 35 agents in Tampa, Florida. Her mission is to spread hope by helping other people every day. And she has stuck to her mission because she is the number one insurance agent in the nation in 2022. I'd like to welcome my next guest, Parita Patel. So this show revolves around divorce and you're actually divorced yourself. Can you tell us a little bit about your divorce journey and how you became involved in the health insurance industry? Absolutely. So I'm sure most people don't ever think that they're going to end up in that position, you know? So I think the first thing is, is it really catches people off guard. And a lot of people are, you know, sad to admit it or have a hard time. But for me, I'm like, okay, it was part of my life. It happened. Um, wasn't hoping that it would happen, but here we are now. And for me, I really wanted to be able to find myself again and figure out what I wanted to do with my life because I had a complete career change around the exact same time I had that divorce happen. So um, I had just re-entered the workforce and I was trying to figure out what to do because it was right after the COVID years. And what I was doing previously was running a fitness company. So obviously um, that did not survive the COVID years. And I found myself in a place where I'm like, okay, well, what do I do now? And redefining who you are from a career perspective is is definitely hard enough, let alone to start all over in the personal side of life. So when you get to that point where you're at a place of, I don't know anything about who I am and what I want to do, and you attach yourself to people and you attach yourself to a career, because the first thing when people ask, you know, what do you do or who are you? You say, oh yeah, I do this for a living and, and I'm married with this. And so just starting all over from scratch is obviously a very scary thing to do. And you can either thrive in that or you could let it completely take you over. So when people first go through this reinvention of themselves, I think it's important to take time to think about what you enjoy doing or what you're really naturally talented at. And I know that I've always wanted to work with people and my background has so many different aspects of what I'm doing between running a business. And when you run a business, you have every hat in the books, right? You have, um, you're, you're doing the financials, you're doing the marketing, you're doing the branding, you're doing everything. And the insurance world was definitely not one I ever thought I would see myself in, but I had had experience running a business and when I first decided to re-enter the workforce after all the COVID years and I had lost my career, at that time, I was still technically married. And, um, you know, I just went onto some job websites and thought, okay, well, let me see what's out there. I thought I actually would be really good at real estate, um, you know, being able to show people homes and being in sales, I think, was something that naturally would be fun for me. Um, so I thought I'd get into real estate and I looked at sales positions cause I'm here in local, um, based in Tampa, Florida. And obviously during the COVID years, everybody wanted to move to Florida. Right. So it was kind of a booming time, but I, you know, uploaded my resume and then I had a company reach out to me and said, Hey, we think you should interview for this. And I went to the interview and it was about insurance. So didn't think it was something I would find myself interested in, but as a 1099, like self-employed individual, I run my own insurance. I don't know, I guess you could call it an agency. So I have a team of like 35 people now and um, being able to stand up on my own two feet again was really what allowed me to get through my divorce. You know, having something that I could just completely get obsessed with and go all into. And I found my voice, I found my strength again to be able to get myself out of a bad position with the divorce and not just be completely alone with nothing to do. So long story short. <laughs> 
Well, fitness and health insurance is not too far off. There's a link between the two. <laughs> right, somewhat. Yeah, definitely. When we're searching for a new health insurance plan, the first decision we encounter is whether we want a private or a public plan. Can you tell us what the difference is between a private and public health insurance plan? Absolutely. There's so many different versions of insurance these days, and a lot of people don't realize that there's a lot of fine print around these types of options. Most people have heard of Obamacare or the ACA, which stands for Affordable Care Act. You have Marketplace, also known as the Public Marketplace. These are all major medical plans. So what major medical really means is that they can't deny anybody coverage based on pre-existing conditions. So you can never be denied insurance if, if it's a major medical plan through the government. So those public plans are all government-based plans. Um, what that really also depends on is your income because it's based on income. So, you know, when they say Affordable Care Act, they make it affordable based on your income. So if you are in the lower income bracket and you don't have something that's offered through an employer, then you could potentially qualify for what they call subsidies, which is basically just like, you know, discounts to be able to get more affordable insurance. So there's a lot of things that go into effect with that, but if you are somebody that has some health conditions, some major pre-existing conditions, especially like the big stuff, you know, the, the cancer, the heart attack, things like that, um, or chronic conditions where you're needing a lot of type of treatment, then the public marketplace will never say no to you. On the flip side, there is private insurance. So what private insurance really is, is it's kind of almost the opposite of that. So if you're relatively healthy, um, then you're in a smaller risk pool of people. And if you're not bringing all these expenses to the insurance company because you don't have pre-existing conditions, then you can qualify for better coverage at better rates. So I always tell you know my clients, like when it comes to choosing your insurance option, obviously it's important to know what are my needs? What is my budget? Like, what is really important to me? Do I have any special things that are necessary? For example, you know, some people have to travel for work. Some people um, need something that works across multiple cities and states. And if you want to be able to choose your doctors, there's so many things that you have to actually take into consideration. But that's the difference between public and private. There are other types of insurance out there. Um, a lot of them, though, if you look in the fine print, it'll say, this is not real health insurance, or this is just supplemental coverage. So I think it's important to be educated, which is tough, obviously, when there's almost like too much information. A lot of people feel very overwhelmed when they start searching for insurance, which is why it's also beneficial to work with some an advisor or someone like that. Now, during divorce negotiations, I get asked a variation of this question a lot. Can mm -hmm. an ex-spouse stay on their ex's health insurance after a divorce? It's difficult because you technically are no longer part of an immediate family. And that is what they require you to have, like be in that immediate family in order to be able to stay on a plan. So technically, yeah, you're, you're not able to stay on your spouse's plan once you have a divorce. Um, you have the ability to stay on for something what's known as like COBRA. Um, and, and COBRA is basically an extension of a person's plan, except now it's something where there's no more contribution from an employer or anything like that. So let's say I'm, you know, I'm getting a divorce and I'm on my husband's health insurance and he has it through his employer. Then technically I would be allowed to continue to have that and stay on COBRA, except I'm not getting the, the, the rates that his employer is offering. I have to pay full price myself. And a lot of times that can actually be really expensive. So I don't think that that's the best option when you are going through divorce. Um, I think there are some states that have individual allowances, um, you know, maybe up to 60 days until you can make a change. Um, and, and really it's going to come down to the individual state. But my biggest answer to that is no, you really can't stay on. So what health insurance options are available for a spouse who was removed from a health insurance plan after a divorce, yeah. other than COBRA that you just mentioned? Right. So really, the you can go directly onto healthcare.gov. And those are where you can house um, or they house the Obamacare marketplace plans, ACA, all of those. That's one option. Just be a little wary of doing that because you know what happens when you get your information out into the internet, right? So pretty much it has, it's now given access to pretty pretty much all the salespeople out there. So what happens, unfortunately, is that when you put your phone number and your email address into the system, you're going to get a ton of people reaching out to you trying to sell you health insurance. Um, it'd be different if you had just maybe one or two people reaching out, but then you're going to have people who are short-term agents, supplement um, agents. They're all just trying to sell one specific product. 
um, as opposed to having someone who has access to all the information out there that can guide you better. But all the options that are out there are available to an individual because once you are going through a divorce, because it's a change in the family size and status that allows you to access everything that's out there. It allows you to have essentially a special enrollment period where you can get onto Obamacare if you want to, you can get a private plan if you want to, um, you can look at short-term options until you're able to get onto your employer plan. So there's a couple of things that people can choose from. So are you saying it's better to find an agent or a broker that you know, and then you can contact them directly and they'll assist you? I think so, because I, I remember once upon a time I had to look for plans myself just because I didn't have one through an employer. And probably for eight months straight, I had nonstop phone calls. And obviously that can be really frustrating um, because if I run my own business and a, a number that I don't recognize could be a potential client, but then it ends up being just like a telemarketer, you know, that can obviously be really frustrating. Um, and then once your information is out there, anybody can really get a hold of it and call you. So I, I would definitely recommend being able to find an advisor that you can trust, someone who's very educated and clearly not looking out for just their own pocket. So California has its own set of laws. How does living in California change your health insurance options? Yeah, um, there are some states that have restrictions when it comes to health insurance. Um, what they really want to do is be able to keep all of that funding in that state, if you will. So there's a few that are very focused on that, which is California, New York, even in the you know tri-state area, you've got Jersey, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Washington. There's different parts of the U.S. where a state-based plan is really your only option. And they have their own version of healthcare.gov. So for California specifically, it's covered CA. But you know, again, if you are looking for something that you're gonna be able to use in multiple states, then a state-based plan might not necessarily be the best option. But for California specifically, it would be covered CA. We often hear people say that they have to wait for a certain month or a certain time to make changes to their health insurance plan. When can we make changes our, to our plan? And perhaps can you explain what open enrollment is and what special enrollment is? Absolutely. So open enrollment happens once a year and it's usually in November and that's for the entire U.S. And, you know, it varies also by sometimes extension. So I know a couple of years ago they had open enrollment from November until I think it was almost April, but that was obviously because of COVID. They wanted to be able to allow people to make changes to their health insurance and have more time to do that. But that's when you're able to make changes, whether if you're on an employer plan that you're not happy with, or if you are wanting to switch to a different Obamacare or ACA plan, you can do that during that time frame. Now, special enrollment is any time of the year, if you have what's called a QLE, which is a qualifying life event. So a qualifying life event could be a couple of things. It could be you're moving, it could be a change in the job, a change in the household. So for example, getting pregnant is not a qualifying life event, but having a baby is a qualifying life event because now you have an additional member of your family. Getting divorced is actually a qualifying life event. Getting married, if you are, I mean, getting out of incarceration. So there's definitely a lot of things that are allowing you to have a qualifying life event, but those are the biggest ones. And some employers have their own time of the year where they are doing special enrollment. I work with a lot of clients that are traveling medical professionals, for example. So they have contracts that renew every 13 weeks or so. And because they're these short-term contracts, then technically every end of the contract, they're able to have a qualifying life event as well. So it varies by employer, but for the biggest um, time frame of the year, open enrollment is in November. After divorce, there's sometimes a little bit of distrust in the other spouse, especially when it comes to caring for the children. I often encounter the parent that is not obligated to carry health insurance for the children, getting second coverage for the children. Can both parents carry health insurance on the children? Yeah, there's actually no limitations on how many you know plans one can hold. Some people might qualify for, for example, Medicaid, and there's child-only plans through the government. And individual states have their own programs where if you meet a certain income threshold, then your children can be covered for free. But being that 
you know, free insurance is great. That doesn't always mean that you have access to whatever doctors you want or whatever providers you want. And that's all only based in the state. So if some people have their children on Medicaid or a program like that, then they can also have their own, for example, private insurance for them as well. So they have something additional, especially depending on the child's needs. But there's no like limitations on how much coverage you can have. Obamacare does have child only plans as well. So if you wanted to just have a plan for your kiddo, then you can do that too. Now, in that instance, which spouse's health insurance acts as primary coverage and which as secondary coverage? There's not really a, it doesn't have to have a definition of one versus the other. It'll come down to which insurance you use at that time. You know, so obviously there has to be some sort of agreement between the two people that, okay, I'm taking my kid to the doctor. Um, we're going to use my insurance for X, Y, and Z needs, and your insurance might be better for, you know, A, B, and C. So then hopefully there's some sort of agreement that the best insurance coverage for that individual child is chosen based on their needs. So there doesn't have to be an official primary or secondary one. There's a lot of difficult terminology when it comes to health, the health industry, and it can be very daunting. So if you could just explain to us some of the common terms, and we'll start off with what is an insurance premium? The premium itself is basically what you're paying to say, I have insurance, you know, so this can very much range. It's dependent on a couple of things. It's dependent on your age more than anything. And then depending on the type of plan, it might be come into consideration whether male versus female, height and weight, whether you smoke or you don't smoke, you have pre-existing conditions or you don't, all of that is taken into consideration, but the premium itself is what you pay every single month. And what can cause insurance premiums to rise? Again, depending on the plan that you're on, premiums increase every year for the most part, mostly along with you know changes with inflation, cost of medical expenses rising. Usually on your birthday, you'll see it adjust a little bit just because every year we're a little bit older, we're a little bit more risky for the insurance company. And then the some plans, if you did have a major pre-existing situation, like if somebody got cancer one year, the likelihood is, is that your premiums will skyrocket the next year. Not always the case. Private plans don't have changes in premiums. If something were to happen to you, usually if something happens to you while you're on one of those plans, you're the most protected that you can be. But a lot of other places, uh, what happens to you can also adjust. And you think about it like car insurance as well, right? You get into an accident, what happens? Your premiums are going to go up as well. So health insurance can be like that too, depending on what you've got. And what is a copay? A copay. So some plans have copays where basically this is my like, you know, my current payment for what I'm doing right now. So for example, if I have a copay, a $10 copay for a prescription, then whatever my prescription is, if it falls into that category, if I go to the pharmacy, all I do is I pay $10 to get my prescription. Or for a doctor's office, you might have a $50 copay. So not only are you paying your monthly insurance premium, but if you have a copay plan, you also have to pay for entry for that specific service that you're requesting. What's the difference between, say, a copay and a coinsurance? A lot of plans, and, and I'll bring in another term right now, you have a deductible, then you have coinsurance, and you have a maximum out of pocket. So a deductible is basically what you are required to pay before your insurance kicks in. So the monthly premium you're paying every single month, and let's say we have a $5,000 deductible. So God forbid I get a million dollar cancer bill. I'm responsible for the initial 5,000 deductible. Then if I have, for example, 80-20 coinsurance, that means the insurance company pays 80% of whatever is left on my bill and I pay 20% of what's left on my bill until I've reached my out-of-pocket max. So when I ask people to identify, you know, their insurance to see whether it's good or not, you want to add your deductible and your max out of pocket. And if you can afford that for something catastrophic, then that plan is worth you moving forward with. So the coinsurance itself is additionally what would be paid by the insurance company versus what is paid by you until you've reached your maximum out of pocket. Is it better to have a high deductible or a low deductible? It's always better to have a low deductible just because that means if something were to happen to you, then you have less to pay out of your own pocket. But I know that some people prefer high deductible plans because it, it can often translate to cheaper premiums. And it comes down to your level of risk taking. If someone doesn't feel like anything's really going to happen to them and they don't mind a higher deductible plan, great. But if you're worried that 
maybe cancer runs in the family or that you do have pre-existing conditions and you think I'm never going to be able to truly meet my deductible. I need to have a lower deductible plan so that the insurance can do its job sooner versus me paying a huge amount of money every year. So. Is there a correlation between how much you pay in premium and what your deductible is? Higher premiums are usually correlated with lower deductibles because then you're paying more monthly and you don't have to pay more if something happens to you. Lower premiums, higher deductibles. So if you can't pay as much on a monthly, then if something bad does happen, you're responsible for more of the bill. What are flex spending accounts or flex spending arrangements? Yeah. So a lot of employers have plans available where they can, where you can also have spending accounts and, you know, savings accounts. There's HSAs, FSAs. It varies depending on the employer, whether they offer something like that. Really what it does is you've got pre-tax dollars that are set aside that can only be used for medical expenses. So, um, you know, versus just paying everything out of pocket and, and, and dealing with that. But you can have these spending accounts that over time can build up. And if something did happen to you, you can access that money to be able to take care of your medical expenses. And what's the difference between a flex spending account and a health savings account? Is one better than the other? So I know that a lot of um, flexible spending accounts are through employers and sometimes you can't keep it even after you've left the employer. HSA accounts are definitely more something that people like to use for tax write-offs and you can take that with you wherever you go. A lot of times employers also contribute to those, which is great because it's almost like getting additional free money. And then if you have a deductible plan, a high enough deductible plan that allows you to put money into those accounts, then, you know, when you're ready to, well, hopefully nothing ever happens to you, but if something does happen, then that money can be used to take care of everything. So I think if you were choosing between the two and HSA would be a better option. In Texas, after filing a case involving children, one parent is obligated to provide dental insurance for the children. Does healthcare coverage include dental and vision? It could. You're able to add it on. Some plans already have that built in. Not everybody wants both, so you can pick and choose what you need, but not every plan comes with a dental and vision plan, but you can add it on and they have separate types as well. As a health insurance agent, what role do you take on during and after a divorce and where can you provide assistance? Um, I think people are in a difficult place. It's already hard to find somebody that you can trust. So I can't speak for everybody else out there that's an advisor. Um, I have a very good relationship with my clients and, you know, I'm Parita, your insurance friend. So obviously I want to be as helpful as I can be to all of my clients to help guide them because it's, it's obviously a stressful time. The last thing that you want to worry about or have to deal with is your health insurance. So I do my best to educate people on all of their options and what they have to choose from. And then if they're qualifying for one versus another, I can guide them in the right direction. Either they can get a plan through me or if they need something very specific, I have people in the industry that I would connect them with. But I'm somebody that has a very active relationship with my clients so that you know, I've literally scheduled surgeries for people before. And hopefully that's not something people actually need me for, but I'm here if they do. So I've really learned the insides of that side of healthcare. So divorce can be pretty expensive and it's expensive to put together your, your support team. Do we have to pay health insurance agents? No, not at all. I mean, again, I can't speak for anybody else, but for me personally, I don't have any fees. I don't charge anything basically paid by the insurance company. So if I'm able to get somebody set up for a plan, the insurance company would cover me. So there's nothing on my side, but other agencies might do something different. What information or documents do you need from us in order to start researching health insurance options? Usually when I'm trying to understand someone's situation, obviously I just want to know what are you doing currently? What are you paying currently? What is the budget that we have? Do we have any specific health needs, medications, pre-existing conditions, a timeline? For most plans, you want to be able to get everything set up within 60 days of when you need the coverage to begin, some cases 45 days. So obviously there is a time frame when you need to be able to get things taken care of. When anybody books an appointment with me, I have specific questions that they are required to answer before they even can book an appointment with me. That way I have all of the information that I really need. Not so much paperwork, but definitely knowing when you need coverage to begin and then obviously your individual health needs. And the final question that I like to ask all of my guests, what do people have to look forward to after a divorce? 
honestly, freedom, I think is the biggest thing. And, you know, I can start my day how I want. I can eat what I want and do whatever I feel like doing. Obviously it's really sad and it's, it's tough and you have to find your new people and start over, but everything happens for a reason. And I firmly believe that. So I think freedom is probably the biggest thing that Health should be your number one priority, and Parita Patel is dedicated to helping you and your loved ones find health insurance coverage options. If you have any questions, please reach out to her at paritahealth.com. For more informative interviews like this one, be sure to follow my podcast or subscribe to my YouTube channel. You can get the links to all of my social media by visiting nextwithlena.com. I'm your host, Lena Wynn, and I hope you'll tune in next time.